Around three and a half thousand years ago, less than a quarter of a million people lived in Britain. That's about the population of Leicester today. They were scattered across the landscape in small groups, and they'd had their triumphs. They'd manipulated nature, clearing forests, settling as farmers. They'd even become master builders. This had been the first age of Britain, but we were still a far cry from being a nation or even an identifiable society. Between 1500 BC and the beginning of the first century AD, life for ordinary people in Britain would change beyond recognition. Populations were increasingly living together in large, complex social groups, and you can see the beginnings of a class system, with the lucky ones ending up visibly rich and powerful, while at the bottom of the pile there were the knots and even slaves. The land was carved up into distinct territories and men were quick to go to war to defend their patch. This was to be the second age of Britain, one that would witness the foundations of a British society and our first faltering steps towards nationhood. The story begins here. This is Dartmoor, over 350 square miles of deserted moorland and peat bog. But around 1500 BC, thousands of people lived here. Generations had poured blood, sweat and tears into clearing this land of forest. And they now wanted to assert who had rights to what. So they built mile upon mile of boundaries, dividing fields and encircling more than 1,500 settlements, like this one, Grimspound. The men and women who piled up these stones were marking out the limits and extent of their land. It's a step on the path to land ownership that ends up with the patchwork of countryside that we're familiar with today. Among these new landowners were masters of a new kind of magic. Imagine seeing this for the first time. A mysterious alchemy that used fire to transform dull rock into something shiny and strong. The ultimate status symbol in Bronze Age Britain. Up here, you can almost sense the energy and ambition of the population. Men and women in control and looking to the future. Enough prepare the people who lived here for what was to happen next. Within a few generations, the whole of Dartmoor was to be abandoned. There's no evidence of plague or massacre or catastrophic fire. But what they did have to face was that most British of blights, rain. It was a deluge of epic proportions. The reason we know is down to the study of prehistoric trees. They show that something disastrous happened to the world's weather in 1159 BC. This is one of the, the specimens from Ireland that first showed the 1159 BC event. Here you've got a tree with putting on wide tree rings up until this wide ring here, which is the growth ring for 1160 BC. And then the next year, we find that it had a horrendous time. There's no summer growth, and similarly for about 18 consecutive years. 18 years took this tree from here to here. And then the next 18 years took it from here to here. It liked it here, and it didn't like it here. And it wasn't just happening on Dartmoor. All around the world, trees tell the same terrible story, and it seems that humans too were feeling the strain. 
in the Mediterranean you had a collapse in Greek civilization. In China you had a major dynastic change from the Shang to the Zhou dynasty. Cities being raised to the ground, collapses of civilization, dark ages, plague, those sorts of references, things which are inherently bad. At first it was thought that some kind of super volcano had caused this global turmoil. But now it seems more likely that a comet traveling near the Earth's atmosphere in 1159 smothered the planet in a massive dust veil. It's very difficult for a modern society to really appreciate what one of these events might have been like. Because remember, people didn't store food to any extent, and the result is they didn't have any great buffer against what would happen. They would feel the effects much more immediately than we perhaps would now. The people back on Dartmoor must have wondered what had hit. 18 summers without sun, wild storms, their crops failed, and the soil was simply washed away. One by one, they abandoned their homes and left Dartmoor, the uninhabitable wilderness it is today. They weren't alone in the face of these disastrous conditions. In Cambridgeshire, miles of farmland were flooded. But here, the farmers found a way to embrace the waters. Just a few centuries earlier, they'd made sense of their world by worming the sun at monuments of stone. But now, a new cult was born with water at its heart. Here at Flag Fen, preserved in the waterlogged ground, there's a remarkable snapshot of people's inner lives. 3,000 years ago, this is where farming and religion met face to face at the water's edge. It was archaeologist Francis Pryor who stumbled across an extraordinary past below the modern fields here. How did you discover Slagfen? Well, actually, I was walking this dike, and uh, it was 20 years ago, and I actually caught my foot on a piece of wood, and I bent down, picked up the wood, and I saw it was cut, shaped, pointed with a narrow-bladed axe. And I then slid down the side of the dike and found more wood. I then got my team out and we investigated all around here and we found um, a mass of posts about 10 metres wide and they ran right across Flag Fen from the power station back there, those silver chimneys, to about 200 metres beyond us here. And about 60,000 posts in all. The timbers seem to be part of a broad pier or walkway that stretched across the watery landscape. Back then, they would have looked something like this. And when they were radiocarbon dated, they turned out to be more than 3,000 years old. A portion of them is preserved today in an environmentally controlled building. What we've got here is sort of quarter of 1%. So it would have been a massive thing running across Flag Fen, and it would have been visible from miles around. It really would have dominated the landscape. But this walkway was about more than just getting from A to B. It was a declaration of people's desire to stop the flooding of their land. I think that what you're looking at here is a, a symbolic statement saying, you know, rather like King Canute, you know, keep back water because the, the floods were coming in from the north and the east. And this is a bit of a symbolic defense against them. So I think people were getting quite edgy at this time and they wanted to make a statement that says, this is our land. All along the edges of the causeway, archeologists found evidence that people were also trying to ease the rising water. You have swords, daggers, spearheads, complete pots. We've even found complete quern stones, corn grinding stones, absolutely complete, unused, placed in there. Well, that doesn't make any sense in practical terms. So, you know, this was a special place and people made offerings here. <laughs> 
Flag Fen was the largest religious centre in Bronze Age Britain. A kind of temple drawing people for miles around. The archaeologists here found intimate personal belongings and precious metalwork, prized material possessions being used to pay homage to the gods in the water. Bracelets, shears for cutting human hair, bronze cooking utensils, and the most valuable of all, swords. These late Bronze Age swords, they're uh, the, the equivalent of a cutlass or a scimitar. Why is the edge so ragged? Yeah, now that's interesting. We've looked at that under the microscope and it looks like this sword has been deliberately smashed against something like a, a, a brick or a stone with a sharp corner. And we found about a dozen here. Um, and very often they've actually been smashed up, which suggests to us that they're being taken out of circulation and moved on into another dimension, into another world. This religion had been born in the wake of 18 years of rain, a crisis response to the changing landscape. Nearly a thousand years later, it was a mainstream faith, bonding people together all over the country. Compelling evidence of just how established this watery religion had become has been found in the heart of London. A helmet recovered from the Thames at Waterloo Bridge, dating from 150 BC. Dredged from the river at Battersea, a shield fashioned around 200 BC. Just two of hundreds of recovered treasures offered to the Thames by people who would have traveled miles to gather. Two and a half thousand years ago, there were no substantial settlements where London is now. Even so, at times, these banks would have been heaving with people. The Thames was the centre of their cosmos, a gateway to their gods. Mind you, the reason for coming down here wasn't entirely high-minded. People must have craved spiritual satisfaction, but they also wanted a rare opportunity to meet and mix. Isolated groups had begun to interbreed. Society was evolving, and even the spiritual land would reflect our new priorities, making personal allegiances and putting down roots. Today, most of us think of our homes as secular places. So it's quite natural to imagine that when people lived in roundhouses 3,000 years ago, pragmatism was behind their construction too. But back then, domestic design was far from just functional. In fact, it seems that when people laid out their homes, there was something sophisticated and lime at work. Clad Hallam on the Hebridean island of South Uist. Here, a new archaeological investigation has shown just how close the gods were to the grit and grime of daily life back in the Bronze Age. What we have is a terrace, all joined together, roundhouses in a curving row, north to south, about seven households, all laid out in a line. Now, back in prehistory, this was actually a thriving place. The excavations here have revealed that the houses were built around a sophisticated plan that made maximum use of sunlight and shadow inside. I'm just walking in through the doorway of the middle roundhouse. It's an enormous building. It's 10 metres in diameter. And as I move in this sunrise fashion around the house, in this particular part of the house, we found smashed cooking pots, grinding stones, bone utensils. This is very definitely the cooking zone. Over here, on the northerly, the dark side of the house, as it were, when the sun goes down, this is the area where people slept. 
and we have a Bronze Age bed. Now, as far as I know, this is the first Bronze Age bed from Britain. And it's not what you'd think of as a bed because it's just a heap of turf. And it stretched from here all the way around to here. But this design was about more than just waking in bed to be greeted by the rising sun. It seems that the sun worship of a thousand years earlier had been entirely replaced by a water cult. In fact, it had been reinvented. Now, instead of visiting monuments to the gods, the men and women of Cladhallan chose to live in them. Religion had come home and the household itself began to take on a sacred new meaning. What we've commonly assumed is that people were turning away from ritual and becoming more pragmatic, practical farmers. What we're actually seeing is that ritual becomes focused within the house. And this is what we've been looking at and we've seen it in extraordinary clarity here on this particular site. Each of the roundhouses had been built and used in a way that revered the circular shape of the sun and its arc from sunrise to sunset. And some of the discoveries here revealed an intensely symbolic use of space in people's homes. Now, moving into the northeast corner, we have a very special area. An area which is almost devoid of finds, apart from some very particular and deliberate ones. Right at the bottom, where I'm standing now, was the crouched skeleton of a teenager, probably a girl. It seems to have been important that her body was placed here before the house was habitable. The corpses of people and animals like this dog were found in the dark northeastern corner of every house here. Whether sacrificial or natural deaths, they completed a design that mirrored the cycle of the day and the cycle of life from birth to death. What we're seeing in a sense is a restatement of the importance of the sun, but not in terms of a public monumentality, but in something that's actually very private and very much a household level. I think we're seeing an enormous change in the significance of what it is to have a home. The centuries passed, and all over the British Isles, we continued to invest in our home life and put down roots. By 500 BC, these sturdy British homes were the building blocks for larger, stronger communities. And what sustained them wasn't just food for the soul. The bare necessities of life back then are the focus of study at Butzer Ancient Farm in Hampshire. Here, the research is based on the premise that to illuminate everyday life in the distant past, you should experience it now. The houses here are based on specific archaeological sites, and they test construction techniques and the durability of the building materials. But also, the scientists at Butzer work out how people survived two and a half thousand years ago. What food they grew, how they processed and cooked it, how many it would feed. People had discovered a new metal much more readily available than bronze, iron. They forged it into more and more efficient tools, and around 700 BC, Bronze Age had turned to Iron Age. This was a massive technological leap, but it heralded an even more significant social change when an acre began to feed twice as many mouths as before. Largely thanks to more effective grinding tools and better iron ploughs and sickles, farms were now producing a substantial surplus, far more food than people needed just to survive. <laughs> 
Of course, what you have to remember is that this was a world without money. So wealth from your land was something to celebrate and shout about. And we've got evidence from around 300 BC of a particular community that did just that by throwing the mother of all parties. Venue for the festivities was a small village outside what is now modern Winchester, a cluster of Iron Age houses excavated in the 1980s. Dotted about on site, archaeologists discovered a puzzling series of pits. In the Iron Age, they often would store grain in holes under the ground. In the past, people have simply assumed that when a grain storage pit stops being used for grain, storing grain, uh, it's just used as a, du a dustbin. One of the most important developments in Iron Age archaeology has been to recognise that the rubbish we find in these storage pits is extremely unusual rubbish. It's probably the end result of a ritual feast or a sacrifice. It may even itself be an offering to the gods. One pit in particular was filled with pottery, the bones of dozens of animals, and even a couple of uneaten carcasses. What you're seeing here is just a tiny fraction of what was found in this one pit. This is part of the jaw of one of the horses. The pig was laid lying on its left side in the centre of the pit. What, what animal is this? Next to the pig was the skeleton of a dog. Detailed analysis showed that the pit had been filled in on a single day. What seems to have happened is there's been a huge gathering, of perhaps two, three hundred people. As part of that feast and gathering, they've slaughtered and sacrificed at least 12 cows, uh, several adult horses, um, sheep, pig, dogs, and that they've also gone out and hunted at least one head to, if you like, throw away that amount of meat in one huge feasting event probably means you've been planning this for years in advance. You've probably got initial ceremonies, then you've got the huge centrepiece event of sacrificing the animals. And then finally, you have a huge meal. It was a flamboyant gesture of excess. Yes, this orgy of killing was a way of thanking the gods for your surplus food. It was also about impressing the neighbours and establishing the dynamics within the group. You're competing with other people by throwing lavish feasts, by inviting as many people as you possibly can to come and eat and share food with you. So the bigger the feast, the higher up the pecking order you are? Iron Age politics works building up relationships with people. I throw you a lavish feast, you do something for me in return. That's, that is the meat and drink of how Iron Age societies work. Feasts like this one were part of an irreversible trend that was going on all over Britain. Large numbers were coming together to trade, to party, to score social points, even to find husbands and wives. Over time, many of these meeting places became permanent fixtures, and some emerged as a kind of forerunner to the town, often on prominent hilltops like this one, Maiden Castle. first time in Britain's history, we were identifying ourselves with large, coherent communities. You could say that this was the beginning of a society as we'd recognise it. Of course, that has its attractions. But as life became more crowded, as it became harder to walk away, harder to avoid conflict, it would become easier for that society to explore its darker side. <laughs> 
At the height of the Iron Age, British metal workers busied themselves with an alarming invention. An infernally clever tool designed for one thing and one thing only, killing human beings. As the population grew and people lived closer together, there were more flashpoints and demands for these weapons were at an all-time high. British society had embraced the arms race and with it, an ideology of war. It had started with the dagger, then the rapier, then the sword. By 500 BC, the new iron swords, stronger, more flexible and cheaper, were fast making this a dangerous world to live in. Perhaps the most chilling evidence for this climate of tension and new levels of bloodshed can be found on a hill called Danebury in Hampshire. Very likely an important element of this was symbolic. A high place like this is visible for miles around, perhaps as a high place, it was in some sense close to the gods as well. Um, it was a, a very visual symbol which could be seen from the entire district. So this will have visually expressed a sense of community as well. They also conducted their religious ceremonies, their community meeting markets. All these kinds of functions are quite likely to have happened in high places like Danebury Hillfort. At first, Danebury looks just like any other hill in this rural landscape. But 20 years of archaeological excavations here revealed one of the most compelling and bloody stories from prehistoric Britain. At its height, Danebury would have been home to about 400 people. But there's little doubt that this place also had a military function. The top of the hill and all the buildings on it would have been surrounded by massive walls and deep ditches. This is a serious bit of engineering. It certainly is. What we're actually walking along here, this modern roadway, marks the original line of the entry into the hill fort. It's also the original slope of the hill. Everything we see around us here, all these great lumps and hollows, are the actual hill fort defences. These are all uh, earthworks which were constructed by the people of the time, moving tens of thousands of tonnes of chalk and earth. There was an outer gate here, and then as we come forward along the roadway, we are approaching the main inner gate. Just in here were very large post sockets for a great timber gate structure which went up over the top here, perhaps with some kind of defensive tower on the top of it as well. So you would have come here through the leaves of the open gate and uh, you would have then seen revealed before you the interior of the hill fort full of storage facilities, houses around the interior of the rampart as well. In the centre, Archaeologists found evidence of a kind of dress rehearsal for cosy small town life. Workshops belonging to weavers, leather and metal workers, and basket makers. Life in a place like this must have been relatively ordered and predictable. You had access to the best craftsmen in the area, and assuming the harvest had gone well, you knew there was enough grain in the storage pits to keep you and your family from starving at winter time but all this security came at a price. Yes, you were protected by your community, but you're also expected to suffer for them and, if necessary, lay down your life. In the event of an attack on Danebury, the men that lived here would have found themselves no longer beholden just to their kin, but to the whole hill fort. And that would quite possibly mean being called to the top of the walls to repel an enemy by force. Well, imagine if you were a warrior attacking Danebury Hillfort, coming up the roadway here to attack the main gate. You would have been carrying your shield in your left arm, spear or sword in the right arm. As you go up the roadway here, your right side is exposed. And that's where I think this great projecting earthwork coming out from the main line of the defences comes into play. Any of the defenders who are up there, uh, uh, equipped with spears and javelins and other weapons, will be able to rain down on you a, a fierce fire on your unprotected side. You'd be extremely vulnerable. This is a killing zone down here. This is not pure speculation. The excavations here uncovered proof of preparations for war. 
just about where we're sitting, just inside the East Gate, was found a, a large pit which had 11,000 river pebbles in it. And we're fairly sure that these are actually sling stones, sling ammunition for defending the East Gate. Also from the hill fort were other versions of sling stones. They're actually carefully shaped of fired clay. It's almost bullet shaped that, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very nice aerodynamic shape, which uh, if you hurl it from a, a sling, is going to fly straight and true to its target. If you've got somebody in the right, because it could well kill them. Human skeletal remains are incredibly rare in the archaeology of the Iron Age. It's thought that most people left their dead to rot in the open air, or perhaps burnt them. A minority seem to have gone in for some kind of mutilation after death. But at Danebury, among the few human bones that have been found, there is grisly evidence of violence during life. We have here part of the pelvis of one individual, and you can see here there are some massive injuries from what appears to be a sword rather than an axe or anything else. So this body was hacked up, the middle part of the body was hacked out. Another example is provided by this skull here. If you look at this frontal bone, here are the eye sockets, there's this puncture wound just above the point between the eyes. And this was caused by a spearhead, which as you can see has a central rib down it. And if you compare this spearhead with that wound, you can see that's what caused it. But it is actually possible that that too was post-mortem. But one other skull here, which I think um, gives us evidence for a lot of this violence actually happening to the living. This has a very uh, interesting, quite small injury on the, the skull here, which has been caused probably by a glancing blow from a, a sword. And this person evidently did survive this. It does show signs of healing. So here we have some unambiguous evidence, I think, of um, a violent event with a weapon actually in life. The human bones showing trauma. The ammunition dump behind the East Gate. The massive fortifications. There's evidence that the mighty gate was burnt to the ground a number of times. All this adds up to a society that met instability with aggression. My own view is that the, the usual state of society is probably what we think of as endemic insecurity. Um, Small-scale societies would not have the institutions to keep the peace in, in the sense we understand it. Many people were armed and I think that lots of people take what we would think of as law into their own hands. You would have seen a spectrum of violence most likely from individual vendettas against neighbours you fell out with all the way up to cattle raiding and maybe um, larger scale warfare. Violence was very much part of people's life experience and it was so woven into the fabric of society that the act of killing could even be exalted as something sacred, part of Iron Age religion. In 1984, workers at a peat-cutting plant at Lindo Moss in Cheshire unearthed a human foot. The police were called to the scene. There they discovered the rest of the body and a murder investigation was launched. Pathologists were soon able to say that he was indeed the victim of a vicious killing, but one that took place nearly 2,000 years ago. The body was taken not to the local morgue, but to his final resting place at the British Museum. The man with no name was dubbed Lindo Man. This is the only chance you actually have had in the whole of British archaeology to come face to face with a prehistoric British person. Uh, he is an Iron Age everyman. He's dark haired, uh, neatly trimmed beard and moustache, about five foot six, well built, and between 25 and 30 when he died. A post-mortem on his body gives an intimate picture of his last moments. At the edge of the wetlands, he ate a meal of bread and herbs. He would never eat again. He's led to the bog naked, 
except for one article of clothing. There is a fox fur armlet, a little band of fox fur around one of his arms. He was smashed twice on the head with a blunt object that cracked his skull. But this was only the beginning of the bloodshed. Next, a garrote was tightened around his neck, and this broke his neck. That's what killed him. And then finally, with that garrote still held tightly, his throat was cut. And at that point, because of the way the garrote is tied, blood would have actually spurted out quite dramatically as part of that. And as the last part of the rite, he's placed face down in a pool of water. But why go to such lengths to finish someone off? Things like the manner of his death you know, points not to simple execution, it points to sacrifice. It's the overkilling which shows that this man isn't a murder victim. Also simply where he's sacrificed. If he's a criminal or even a victim of crime, why is he actually in this bog miles away from the nearest settlement you know, in an area which people at that time probably thought was perhaps magical or dangerous or mystical? And here's you know, the ultimate offering or sacrifice of a whole person. However horrible Lindo Man's death, what you have to remember is that he lived in a world where brutality was always on the surface. But more than that, there's the uncomfortable possibility that violence played a key part in forging and developing his society, moulding its boundaries, its beliefs, its collective identities. For warfare, human sacrifice. This was a savage land for sure. But living on a knife edge was sorting the men from the boys, the leaders from the lead. And out of the bloodshed, strong regional identities were beginning to grow. As an island nation, the British don't really have to live with border crossings in the way that our neighbours in Europe do, but it wasn't always like that. Back in history, our land was crisscrossed with frontiers between different tribal territories, and these were behind a series of developments on the road to British nationhood. This hill marks a border crossing hotly contested around the time of Christ. Later Roman writers named the tribes that would have squabbled over it. The area up there was held by the Dabuni tribe. Behind me it was controlled by the Catavalauni, and this hill and the land to the south was in the hands of the Atrobates tribe. Back then, ordinary people on the ground probably had very little sense of belonging to a British nation. But what they did have was a strong, growing tribal identity. And for the Atrobates, their territory came with something that said in no uncertain terms who they were, a logo. It's the first public art in Britain. A vast horse marked out in chalk on an Oxfordshire hillside 3,000 years ago. Hill figures are found nowhere else in Europe, and this one marks a key moment in the development of British identity. The people who lived here in the late Bronze Age were marking their land with their tribal emblem. A thousand years later, when the Atrobates held this hill, their figurehead was as potent as ever. And when they began to mint coins, the first British cash, they were embossed with it. The people of the horse were projecting a strong image of their unity. But inside, tribal society was being carved up. 
By the first century BC, individuals begin to emerge from the archaeology. Their faces, and thanks to the arrival of writing from Rome, their names, like Commius and Tinkamarus. Leaders like these, singled out from the crowd, were a new elite. And of course, overlords need underdogs. These are shackles from the first century BC, designed not for animals, but for people who were tethered together by the neg. This was an underclass, denied their liberty and sold as slaves. It seems that along with the luxury goods you might expect, the grand houses, the fine chariots, at the end of the Iron Age, you demonstrated your status by enslaving and owning your compatriots. This was a time of conspicuous consumption, where people joined the list of commodities. Hengisbury Head on the Soul in Dorset. 2,000 years ago, this place was Britain's first real trading port. And it's here that compelling evidence of this brutal class system has come to light. When Hengisbury was uh, first excavated at the beginning of the 20th century, um, they found uh, quite a lot of pottery here uh, of an unusual kind. And no one really knew where it came from. They, all they could say is it, it isn't British. Uh, and it wasn't until the 1970s, 1980s, that um, archaeologists looked in more detail at the pottery. They found lumps of Roman uh, wine jars. So suddenly one realised that this wasn't just a local port um, serving the cross-channel trade. It was, it was latching into a much more distant trade network. Excavators found evidence of upmarket luxury goods all over the site. Coloured glass, figs, spices, fine wines, exotic perfumes. You had um, an elite, and uh, that elite would display itself uh, in some way. Hospitality was a very uh, usual way, e excessive hospitality. Flashy goods, things like that, gift exchange. And uh, to maintain themselves, that elite needed more and more and more exotic things. Uh, so that immediately something new came on the market, uh, they would want it. But an ancient document written by a Greek called Strabo proves that ports like Hengisbury also shipped out human cargo. Strabo lists exports from Britain and he talks about hunting dogs, he talks about metals, uh, he talks about corn and slaves. And slaves is the top of his list. Slaves would have been possibly the prime commodity. Um, there's one wonderful classical text talking about Gaul uh, that says these, these Gauls, these uh, Celtic barbarians in Gaul are, are remarkable people. Uh, they give you a slave for an amphora of wine. So there you've got uh, an exchange mechanism. Contemporary sources say that hundreds, maybe thousands of British slaves were held in Italy at this time. Clearly, traders here had few qualms about using their countrymen and women as a cash crop. And this trade was driven by a growing awareness of the mighty empire that was now right on our doorstep. Things were very fast. Um, and that period, let's say about 100 BC, probably they were aware of something quite interesting out there happening called Rome or the Roman Empire. And when Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, Rome was very much known and people did flee from the continent and, and come to Britain and say, there's this awful chap Caesar, you know, beating us up and killing us all. So this was a time of very, very rapid change. As ordinary people here started to take an interest in Rome, Rome began to take an interest in us. The bubble of British prehistory was about to burst, and for the first time, the name of this land, Britannia, was going to be written down. During the short part of the summer that remained, I resolved to proceed to Britannia. I thought it would be of great service to me if I only entered the island, looked into the character of the people, and gained knowledge of their localities, harbours, and landing places.
His name was Julius Caesar, and he was the first person to write an eyewitness account of life on British soil. But Caesar's interest in Britannia wasn't entirely anthropological. He came across with two legions of the order of 10,000 troops and made landfall at the White Cliffs of Dover, where he saw very large numbers of enemy warriors awaiting him. So he moved along the coast some miles, possibly to where we are here at Deal, uh, where he beached his ships. The British that faced Caesar on this shore must have felt a mixture of terror and rage. Small consolation then that this was not, despite all appearances, a Roman invasion quite yet. One of the principal reasons Caesar came here was nothing to do with the Britons at all. It was that he wanted a publicity coup. And what better could there be than to take a Roman army out beyond the boundaries of the known world? This was the equivalent, the Roman equivalent of a moonshot. What we do know is that it was a failure because the ships were very badly damaged by a sudden storm. He was very lucky actually to be able to get out of Britain without his army being massacred. The British had had to deal with the Romans for less than a week. But a year later, they were back with a force more than double in size. This time, the army stayed for nearly six months. Some tribes here would have seen their leaders coerced or seduced by the Roman cause and would have watched as this man, Caesar, took notes about their homeland. The island was triangular in form and about 2,000 miles in circumference. Most of the inland inhabitants were clad with skins and wore their hair long. Their buildings were exceedingly numerous, sometimes in fortified towns, and the number of people count. It's probable, I think, in the last couple of centuries BC, the peoples of southern Britain would have had some nascent sense of being distinct and different, of being, being British. Probably the sudden appearance of this alien power from the south will have very much sharpened this need for a sense of common identity. And I would imagine that the notion of Britishness is appearing around about this period, around about the last century BC. We'd come along from the disparate, tiny settlements of a thousand years before. But the greatest test of British metal was just around the corner. Yes, the Romans had gone, but they'd be back. Within a century, the horizon would be bristling once again with Roman ships. And this time, the imperial juggernaut would change everyday life in Britain forever. And indeed, the Romans arrive next week at the same time. The accompanying book, Seven Ages of Britain, is in the shops and costs two pounds. To make an order, call 0870-1234-344 or click on to channel4.com slash shop. Up next, arguably the most memorable James Bond, Sean Connery, is the Brit who went to Hollywood. <laughs>